I am so happy to see all of your beautiful faces. Tonight I'm going to read one short story about Brussels and Venice that inaugurates what will one day be my second book, Fancy Dinner for Homosexuals. One anecdote about Douglas Crimp and myself. One tale about a bar in Mexico City that appear in my first novelette, Retrospective. And finally, one essay on magic homophobia, previously appeared on Buenos Tiempos International and written in collaboration with Marnie Slater. So as said, I start with a text titled 12 Literary Pansies in Desperate Need of a Lesbian Friend. May Day was yesterday and Brussels hosted the festivities of the International Workers' Day. From the sole window of my apartment, I get a privileged view over the one and only canal in the city. It is very densely populated, in this very densely populated area of the world, there are plenty of them. The lonely canal is regularly transited by cargo barges that I imagine coming from the Netherlands to deliver in Wallonia or coming from Wallonia to deliver in the Netherlands. On the very day of yesterday, those did not run the canal. I could see sailing these leisure little yachts and this canoe the promise of a bank holiday morning. Also yesterday, everyone was planning to depart to Venice that hosts another art biennial every two years. Boats! Boats! And boats in Venice! I was not to go to Venice anytime soon, and nor was Francesca. So I contemplated the play of hers. Sissy was walking along the boulevards that long ago were basins for canals. To me, she was a flower bouquet because I could only catch her from my still position by my window. Her headdress was a messy bunch of wild flowers, what explains what I just stated in the previous phrase. Some of the flowers were pink, other flowers had a sort of whitish color, and there was also purple flowers and reddish flowers. I do not know if pansies are wild flowers, nor can I, nor can I distinguish even one of the flowers on her head, but I bet there were pansies there. One thing I know is that she had a beautiful face, because it is very important to have a beautiful face. Under that face, she was wearing a bucolic white shirt on top of her fluffy and shaggy sport pants. Surely graciously wore sissy shoes not. This means that surely graciously wore sissy shoes not. During her perambulation, she was to encounter a brass band play, playing the Internationale. I mean, the Internationale. Sometimes I play the Internationale in my reading. Tonight I'm not going to play the Internationale. Listening to the music, there were couples and there were families. And only two pairs of people hold their fists up in the air. Brussels and Company was looking at Sissy. Fuck you, Brussels and Company! Fuck you, people in Company, she said. The last one to leave the club is the winner of the night, and she gets to switch off the lights. Now I'm going to read the second text that I announced I was going to read which is an encounter in between Douglas Crimp and myself. It's a, it is entitled, This is a meaningful anecdote about Douglas Crimp at Jan Mott Gallery in Brussels. 
and it reads last Friday sorry last Friday evening I went to Jan Mott Gallery in Brussels where a public conversation between Douglas Crimp and Jan Mott himself was to happen. When speaking about the experience of his youth as a gay scholar and curator in New York in the 60s and 70s, Douglas Crimp would talk about a bar where the art crowd gather. That was Maxus, Kansas City, sitting at 213 Park Avenue South in New York City. This bar had two rooms, explains Douglas. The first, of, the first one of these rooms was poorly illuminated and there congregated a group of men, I mean a group of very celebrated artists, including figures such as the conceptual artist Lawrence Wiener or the land art classic Robert Smithson. In comparison to the one on the front, the back room was shining with light, illuminated by four red neon tubes placed in a corner over some seats. There, in the back room, could be found a dense bunch of drag queens and artists. Douglas Trim himself had to go through the first of the rooms and there, as a curator at Guggenheim Museum, he would greet the acolytes by the bar. At this precise moment, according to what Douglas said, he would be there in the first room with these first people, but desiring the glow in the second room. Still in 2015, when the conversation I am narrating here takes place, he would clearly remember that glow. Right after the public conversation, the Brussels-based artist Pierre Bismuth asked a question expecting Douglas to enunciate a more direct judgment. He wanted him to say that the back room was better. The crimp declined. Some minutes after that, I approached Douglas Crimp to congratulate him and thank him for such a delicious moment. Whatever I told him is irrelevant. What matters here is that Pierre Bismuth joined our conversation and happily said, Alberto, why are your trousers so short today? To what I answered, it is a present for Douglas. Then Douglas Prim smiled. The third text in this reading uh, comes from Retrospective, so uh, the first novel that I, I ever wrote. And it is entitled Huawei's Bar in Mexico City. And it is about Huawei's bar in Mexico City. For the past weeks, Comrade and I have been attending ballroom dancing classes. It exists that question of coordination, hear the rhythm, there a certain pleasure that is learned during a state of basic education and which brings style. In Mexico City, you can visit the prime spot for dancing, the Huawei's Club. Open every day from an hour that is not known to me, you will never close before you desire to leave. You might want to check Marrakesh Saloon first, situated very close to Huawei's at the 18th number of Republica de Cuba Street. Pretty crowded in the weekends, you cannot miss the demonstrations offered by the numerous dancers and podiums. Once you have managed to drag your beautiful face to the corner of Lazaro Cárdenas Street and Republica de Cuba Street, where Huawei sits, you will be asked for a variable amount of pesos, whose universal symbol is the same one used by the United States dollars, but with one vertical bar instead of two. Whatever the price would be, it is worth it. Plan to the second floor and be welcomed into heaven 
you have reached the ultimate room for salsa and mambo where quite regularly an hour of couple dancing would suddenly stop as if everyone had a watch pulled up their rectos. Simply no fuss about it. One of the multiple Shakiras will then rock the dance floor for one or two songs. She will be systematically followed by a stripper who, after mouth-fucking a couple of lucky members of the audience, will free the room. And the choreography in three acts will start again for you to enjoy and for the world to be a better world. At Huawei's I helped the bleeding guy in the toilet and it felt good. I felt like an old queen, I felt like a drag queen. It is a fact that the only group of young men who are systematically targeted by serial killers are homos. The other two groups are elder, elderly people and young women. And to finish the reading tonight, I'll read an essay on magic homophobia. And it is, it is entitled Magic Homophobia. It was firstly written for Buenos Tiempos International for an exhibition of Papis Papis. Uh, and it's written together with uh, Marnie Slater. As I said, it's entitled Magic Homophobia. And it says, When walking through the streets, exiting a night shop, after buying cigarettes or waiting for a bus, I am often called names. One recurrent name I am called is Harry Potter. Surely this refers to the fact that I wear round glasses, but it actually strongly underlines my homosexuality. I am a geek like homosexual. If Harry Potter taught us something, it is that no one should live in a closet, says J.K. Rowling on her Twitter, and Dumbledore is gay. One week ago in a homo bar, somebody approached me and I excitedly spoke to my friend. Sorry, somebody approached me and excitedly spoke to my friend in their local dialect. As I could not understand the language, I presumed an extra dose of magic homophobia when overhearing Harry Potter and I turned back to my beer. But to my astonishment, that body had fallen in love with mine because of my resemblance to the famous wizard. Then we held hands and looked at each other. I have always fallen in love with those with, who did so with me. It is my very own strategy to avoid defeat. And Dumbledore is gay. Well, thank you.